start fishing. WKRM Channel 2 on your side. Channel 2 News at 5 with Ann Holt and Bob Mueller, meteorologist Davis Nolan, and the sports guy, Steve Phillips. Good evening, everyone. Vice President Al Gore came home to Tennessee looking for ways to make the federal government more efficient. Gore says he found some answers in Spring Hill at GM's Saturn car plant. Channel 2's Phil Williams was there this morning for the vice president's visit. The wheel covers are made from... Uh, it's a nylon. Vice President Al Gore got a first-hand look at the Saturn car plant, a plant praised for its revolution of the American automobile industry. I just have to say on a personal basis, I am so proud of what you all have done here. Meeting later with Saturn workers, Gore sought their advice on reinventing federal government. You've already redesigned the automobile industry. Now I want to ask you to think with me about how the lessons you have learned could be applied to changing the way the government does business in relating to the American people. Everybody's ideas are listened to firsthand. There's not a dumb idea that can be suggested, and I think that's a good rule of thumb that uh, sometimes we need to, in, in the government aspect, letting people know where they stand, how things are going, uh -huh. will make a big difference in your final result. But you gotta know what you want as a result when you start. That's, that's great. Perf good. Ironically, the Clinton administration has raised doubts about whether it can even run the White House, much less reform the entire federal bureaucracy. But Gore says even Saturn had startup problems. Absolutely. Don't, don't judge us by the shakedown, Cruz. Judge us by our results. We're learning from early mistakes, and we're moving forward. The Clinton-Gore team isn't the first to look to business for ways to make government more efficient. Good to be here. Thank you. But whether Gore's efforts will be more than just another publicity stunt is still open for debate. Phil Williams, Channel 2 News, at 5. Vice President Gore returned to Washington this afternoon. He will present President Clinton with his proposals for streamlining the federal government this fall. And While police are uncovering more gruesome details in the murders of three eight-year-old boys in West Memphis, Arkansas. Channel 2's John Siegenthaler has been following this story, and he joins us now from the newsroom with the latest. John? Well, Ann, one of the teenagers arrested in this case is talking to police, and he's telling a very disturbing story. A story of bizarre cult rituals, torture, and sexual mutilation that ended with the murder of the three boys. It was reported in today's edition of the Memphis Commercial Appeal. These are the victims, all second graders. On May 5th, Michael Moore, Steve Branch, and Christopher Byers went riding on their bikes. Hours later, they were found dead in a drainage ditch in West Memphis, Arkansas. Now, three teenagers have been arrested and charged with murder in the case. And one of them, 17-year-old Jesse Lloyd Miss Kelly Jr., gave police a statement. In it, he said the murder of the three boys was part of a cult ritual. Miss Kelly says he watched as his two co-defendants choked their victims, sexually mutilated one, and raped another. Miss Kelly also said that the three teens had participated in cult activity before the murders that included killing, cooking, and eating dogs. In the statement, Miss Kelly said, quote, we usually skin it, then make a fire and eat it and stuff. The parents of the victims say they want justice. That's almost chasing the hell. If I had to, to see they get what they deserve, and I will. Whatever it takes. Parents are very upset in this case. Now, there was no reference made to Satanism by Miss Kelly, just cult activity. The teenage defendant's mother denies her son was involved in a cult and says this story will hurt her son's chances for a fair trial, man. Thanks, John. The Benton County District Attorney says he's closing the book on the tragic deaths of two Camden teenagers. 15-year-old Kelly and 12-year-old Brent Surratt died last month from a single gunshot fired by their father. The shootings were declared accidental, and this afternoon, the Benton County Grand Jury agreed it did not indict Alan Surratt on any criminal charges. Well, in just a few minutes, the Metro Council will begin a week of hearings into Mayor Phil Bredesen's $840 million budget plan. That's the proposal which includes a 77-cent property tax increase, in part to pay for a new downtown arena. The hearings begin each night at 5.15 in the council chambers, and they are open to the public. 
Well, today was the hottest day of the year so far. It was a perfect day for a dip in the pool. But a lifeguard shortage has kept the gates at two metro pools locked. Channel 2 Celeste Bishop has the story. You're as a rescuer swimming toward and approaching a victim. Willis Cater has been a lifeguard for 18 years. The hours are long, the money's not great, and the training's tough. You must be able to retrieve a 10-pound brick, uh, swim 9 feet, retrieve a 10-pound brick. You also have to be able to swim underwater 15 feet, surface dives, and different kind of things like that. But there just aren't enough Willis Caters out there. This year, Metro is short nine lifeguards, so the city will have to close two pools. And if things don't change, it's going to be a long, hot summer for the kids and parents who count on the Napier pool. It's, it's going to be kind of sad because, you know, every summer they, they get, you know, kind of hyped up to go down and go swimming and everything. A lot of other kids just hanging out, getting into trouble this summer, hanging around with the, you know, guys who sell dope. You know, it's just a real bad thing that's happening. Metro Parks officials say they've had roughly 60 people who called about being a lifeguard. Despite the large numbers of people who sign up to be lifeguards, very few actually make it. Instructors say most students are unable to pass very tough written and physical skills tests. Metro is trying to get more people to sign up for classes that begin later this month. And if the city can find a few more lifeguards, the Napier Pool will be the first to open. Celeste Bishop, Channel 2 News at 5. Now, Metro hopes to start training new lifeguards next week. Officials say it could take three or four weeks before they could possibly open the Napier or White's Creek pools. Fans of the late Conway Twitty flocked to his Hendersonville home today. Crowds at Twitty City turned the front entrance into a huge floral arrangement. Twitty died son suddenly Sunday morning from an aneurysm. His fans, young and old, say they'll never forget him. I guess I, you could say I was his number one fan. And uh, I'm going to miss him terribly. This is my granddaughter, Sherry. She was one of his number one fans. This is my way of saying goodbye to him. Fans will gather in Hendersonville Wednesday to remember Conway Twitty at a memorial service. It begins at 2 o'clock at the First Baptist Church of Hendersonville. Twitty will also be remembered tonight with a tribute during the Music City News Award. A one-of-a-kind voice. Mm -hmm. Well, the 27th annual TNN Music City News Awards cap off the first day of fanfare. The awards are just a few hours away at the Opry House. And that's where Channel 2's Melissa Penry is tonight. Melissa? Well, Bob, artists have been arriving here all day long getting ready for the show. And it's become a tradition that this show here at the Opry House every Monday night opens up fanfare. And it really is appropriate because it's the fans who vote on these awards. Now, rehearsals were underway most of the day, almost up to the last minute. Susie Boggess and George Jones, along with Ricky Van Shelton, are tonight's hosts. Some of the multiple nominees who could walk away big winners tonight are Garth Brooks, Vince Gill, and George Strait. But this wasn't the only place alive with activity today. About 24,000 fans are in town this week. And those wanting to be ready signed in today so they can rock and roll tomorrow. Wow. Inside the exhibit halls, behind closed doors, country singer Hal Ketchum put a personal touch on his booth, painting the backdrop himself. And I set these canvases up in, in my backyard on a, on a good day, set them up on concrete blocks, put them together, and thought, well, Mama Knows the Highway is, is going to be a record soon, and I like murals of uh, desert roads, so here we are. Singer Marty Brown brought a fan along of a different kind, the one that runs on electricity, not country music. It gets hot, and uh, shoot, and, and if it gets too hot on the people, they come up here sometime and sweat on all of them, and we'll just tilt that fan over and cool them and cool them off. Miles away from the fanfare rush, Garth Brooks had his mind on his golf game. Golf is your game, huh? Golf is not my game. I thought you could already see that. So far, I am one for one. One is in the woods over here. Vince Gill, Earl Thomas Conley, and one-time pro turned country singer Doug Supernoff also teed up to raise money for the Tennessee Baptist Children's Homes. Now, you can see other stars out tonight at events besides the awards. Colin Ray will be in concert here at Opryland. Bluegrass artists will be performing at the State Fairgrounds, and the Cactus Brothers will be singing at Tower Records. 
And fanfare gets into full swing tomorrow, Bob. There'll be a whole day of exhibit halls open with the artists there signing autographs and concerts at the state fairgrounds. Back it will be packed out there tomorrow. Thanks, it Melissa. sure will. And as Channel 2 News at 5 continues, President Clinton keeps up the search for a Supreme Court nominee. A decision is made in the custody fight between Woody Allen and Mia Farrow. And a new ground is broken in the world of rock and roll. At the Olive Garden, at the end of every bowl of crisp salad, every basket of breadsticks, and every smile, you will always find another, and another, and another. Because at the Olive Garden, the word generosity begins with the G, but ends only when you are happy. The Olive Garden Italian restaurant, where all the best of Italy is yours. Peter Jennings for ABC's World News tonight. I hope you'll join us every weekday at 5.30. And then stay tuned for Channel 2 News at 6 with John Sigenthaler and Ann Holt. The competition is comparing itself to Grand Marquis. Go figure. Two standard airbags? One. V8? V6. More passenger and cargo room? Less. Grand Marquis. The winner by a bushel. Here's another way to win with the full-size Grand Marquis. Full-size cash back of $1,500. Get more room, more power, and something else the competition doesn't offer. $1,500 cash back. Take a good look at your Lincoln Mercury dealer today. The U.S. Supreme Court has handed down a ruling regarding a hot topic here in Tennessee, prayer at high school graduations. The court led stand a Texas decision allowing student-led prayer when a majority of students favor it. The American Civil Liberties Union says it will continue to fight such prayers. President Clinton says he hasn't decided on a nominee to fill an upcoming Supreme Court vacancy. At a Rose Garden function, Clinton was asked if Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt was the front runner. The president answered that he's not ruling anyone out yet. Nashvilleian Gilbert Merritt, a federal judge, is one of the top three contenders. Well, the long and bitter court battle between Mia Farrow and Woody Allen is over, at least for now. Here's more on that story and other news in tonight's World Digest. A New York judge ruled Mia Farrow should keep custody of five-year-old Satchel, seven-year-old Dylan, and 15-year-old Moses, the three children she shares with Woody Allen, her former lover. Allen has indicated he might challenge the custody decision. Excuse me, gentlemen. Excuse me. A group of illegal Chinese immigrants today boarded buses bound for detention centers in New York, Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. They came ashore on a New York beach yesterday. Eight of the immigrants died trying to swim ashore when their ship ran aground. Jury selection is underway in the trial of two whites accused of abducting a black tourist, dousing him with gasoline, and setting him ablaze. Christopher Wilson of New York City sustained burns over 40% of his body. And a whole lot of shaking has been going on in Cleveland, where groundbreaking ceremonies were held for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum. Cleveland won its bid to be the home of the museum seven <laughs> years ago. Big guitar out there. It is. Well, three H's sum up today's weather. Hot, hazy, and humid. Davis will tell us how long it will last up next. It was pretty hot and oh, humid today. It was today. so nice yesterday. But today there was, was like a little breeze today. In the face. That's right. Uh, we sort of warmed up very quickly after a cool weekend, and temperatures were all the way up into the 90s for the first time this year. And uh, Welcome like, to summer. Huh? That's right. The next couple of days are going to be very similar, hot and humid, high temperatures in the low 90s, and only the slight chance of an afternoon thunder shower and the heat and the humidity, but there is always that chance just because of that heat and the humidity. Now, the reason why it's warmed up so rapidly is a big ridge of high pressure up in the upper level winds, 20,000 feet. You can see how they make sort of a mountain there with an the actual clockwise curvature in the winds there. Now, underneath high pressure in the upper atmosphere, you find warm temperatures in the summertime. It can create a heat wave. No 100 degree temperatures in our forecast, but look at the 5 p.m. temperatures. Warm enough. We were 91. That's our high so far today. And that's also our current temperature reading here in Nashville. Let's go to the Almanac, 91 the high, 65 the low. There's your record of 99 set in 1933 for the high end. 47 the record low set in 1894. Sunrise 529 tomorrow morning and sunset 802 tomorrow evening. No rainfall today. We're below normal for the month by 79 hundredths of an inch and for the year by 2.86. And right now it's mostly sunny, still a steamy 91. 
The relative humidity is 47%, but that's relative to that 91 degree reading. That's still a lot of moisture in the air. The dew point running in the mid-60s right now. South wind at 14, the pressure is falling 29.96 inches of mercury. Here's our national satellite view. Big thunderstorms push across Chicago this afternoon. Some of the suburbs in south and southwest Chicago saw four to five inches of rain, some localized street flooding in that section. And meanwhile, we're watching big thunderstorms erupt in the Great Plains of Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska, where they have tornado watches in effect. Several areas in Nebraska hard hit by tornadoes yesterday, and many of the eastern sections of these states may see the same once again this evening and uh, through the nighttime hours tonight. Meanwhile, tomorrow's forecast map shows that system doesn't move very quickly for us. We're going to remain in the hot and humid air with the front moving ever so slowly from about oh, the western portions of uh, Kansas and Nebraska to the eastern portions of uh, Kansas and Oklahoma, southeastern Kansas, that is, and finally pushing into Missouri there by tomorrow evening. That's a very slow movement of a front. That means little change for us, still a southerly flow of wind and still a lot of humidity around the air and still temperatures running in the 90s for highs. Call it low 90s tomorrow. Now, we're going to see a couple of days more of this, and maybe by, oh, the mid to latter part of the week, I should say Thursday and Friday, we're going to cool things back down to 80s for highs and low to mid 60s for lows. But it's going to be warm and muggy tonight. Take a look at the forecast for tonight. A low of about 70 degrees, fair skies. Now, that's uh, going to be the one of the warmer temperatures for an overnight low we've seen in quite a while. And today was the warmest so far for the high end this year. Southwest wind 6 to 12, low of 70 tomorrow. Warm and breezy, partly sunny, only the slight chance of an isolated afternoon thunderstorm. 90 for a high, 70 for a low. We still see pretty much the same weather on Wednesday, but an increase in showers Wednesday night. Best chance for thunderstorms on Thursday. Then we cool down a tad on Friday and Saturday as we see it right now. Take all we can get. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Davis. We're already working on news stories for Channel 2 News at 6 and 10. John Siegenthaler joins us now from the newsroom with a preview. John? That's right, Bob. Coming up on Nightside tonight at 10, country superstar Garth Brooks is used to making history, but he probably never expected what happened today in Texas. You'll find out. Plus, on Channel 2 News at 6, a frightening incident involving three local students, and police say they were just random victims. We'll be coming up here in about 40 minutes. Bob? We'll see you then. Thanks, John. And still ahead in sports, George Foreman prepares for tonight's big fight. While players for Seattle and Baltimore try to get over last night's big fight. Well, a new job has been landed for a much-traveled coach. You know, in racing, they have Suitcase Jake Elder. <laughs> and he's been calling that because he moved around so much. Maybe it's Suitcase Larry Brown for basketball, you think? After more than a week of speculation, the Indiana Pacers have hired Larry Brown as their new head coach. Brown stepped down as head coach of the L.A. Clippers after they were eliminated in this year's NBA playoffs. Indiana becomes his fifth NBA team, and he also coached collegiately at UCLA and Kansas. Well, you can tell the temperature is going up. Baseball fights are becoming more numerous and more intense. In Baltimore last night, the Orioles' Mike Yusina hit Seattle's Bill Hasselman in the left shoulder with a two-out in the seventh. Baltimore up by four runs. Hasselman says he charged out in self-defense. A 20-minute fight erupted. Seven players and Seattle manager Lou Pinella were ejected from the game. Yusina says he did not hit Hasselman intentionally. Oh, I didn't, I didn't throw him on purpose. I mean, uh, it was a five-to-one game, and, and I had two strikeouts, and nobody on base. And, I mean, that's, uh, that's not the way I play the game. That's, that's you know, it's, it's a silly way to do it. And I just did the thing that, that I thought was right. It was a reaction, you know. It came up to my head and, and tried hitting me, I thought. And uh, I'm going to go out there and protect myself. Fines and suspensions from the fight have not yet been announced. Well, it's doubtful tonight's fight for the lightly regarded and vacant WBO heavyweight championship will be as good as the one in Baltimore. George Foreman says this will be his last fight, but then he said that before. Big George will pull down $10 million for tonight's WBO heavyweight title bout with Tommy Morrison. He is 26 and 1 since starting his comeback, and he says this is the last fight for him. I, I like to think that uh, I've put everything into this particular fight. I want to go out there and do the best I can, win the WBO title, and walk out into the sunset with other things to do. I set this as a goal for myself. The fight for the title again is what I wanted, and I've got no goals beyond this fight. Well, it is time for our NASCAR Tonight segment. For those who thought last year was the start of a tailspin for Dale Earnhardt, think again. Earnhardt hit a slump last summer, then lost his crew chief in the offseason, but yesterday the Intimidator dashed to his third straight win, uh, second straight rather, third if you count the all-star race he's feeling pretty good about his team we're enjoying it with this team this team's really fired up again and we're, we're pulling hard as a team and you know we got down last year and really really had a bad year so to come back and run as good as we have this year and you know it's just pulling the team together really working hard together 
And it shows in the point standings, too. Dale Earnhardt up 1,896 points. He is more than 200 points ahead of Rusty Wallace. To give you some idea, there's only 200 points separating second and tenth uh, in the standings. Rusty Wallace in second. Then it's Dale Jarrett, Davey Allison, Jeff Bodine, Morgan Shepard is sixth, Kyle Petty, Ken Schrader, Ernie Irvin, Jeff Gordon, Darrell Waltrip's 13th, Michael Waltrip 17th, Bill Elliott 18th, and Sterling Marlin 19th in the point standings. And in football, the New York Giants have signed running back Otis Anderson to a one-year deal for an undisclosed amount of money. The 36-year-old Anderson is entering his 15th NFL season. He played sparingly the last two years behind Rodney Hampton. Don't see it very often, but a Super Bowl MVP comes out in the next two years after that. He's rarely heard from. Someone takes his job. Thanks, Steve. A global push is underway to attack AIDS tonight. That's coming up next. And we'll show you one victory in that fight. It's keeping hemophiliacs healthy. When you need... Some of the greatest medical minds in the world are in Germany this week for the ninth annual Global AIDS Conference. 15,000 researchers and scientists are comparing notes on the deadly disease. Protesters also showed up saying they want the interest of AIDS patients fully represented. Today, doctors debated the effectiveness of the AIDS drug, AZT. One new development in the AIDS fight is offering more hope to hemophiliacs. It lessens their chances of contracting AIDS and hepatitis during transfusions. Channel 2 medical reporter Jessica Etz explains how in our To Your Health report. Three-and-a-half-year-old Mark Chamelian has hemophilia. Because his blood doesn't clot the way it should, he's at risk for uncontrolled internal bleeding, even after minor injuries. The bleeding will go on for uh, hours or, or days if it's not treated. Hemophilia is a genetic blood disorder passed almost exclusively from mothers to sons. Left untreated, it can lead to severe pain, arthritis, even death. For years, patients like Christian relied on transfusions of a blood protein to help control bleeding. But because it was made from human plasma, patients were at risk of contracting hepatitis and AIDS. Now, researchers have come up with a genetically engineered version of the protein, a drug known as cogenate. Part of the beauty of the new drug is that it eliminates the possibility of blood-borne infections like hepatitis and AIDS. And that means peace of mind for patients and their families. Not having to worry about what's what's in the medicine that you're taking that's nice mark goes to the hospital when he needs a treatment older patients like christian can give themselves the drug at home dr beardsley says patients usually know when the bleeding begins if they tell us there's a bleed starting we believe them and go ahead with treatment dr beardsley says someday there may be a cure for hemophilia but in the meantime cogenate is the best answer to a prayer this is an advance that we've been looking forward to in the hemophilia uh, community for years Jessica Etz, Channel 2 News at 5. And finally, Corvette owners came from all over the country to be in Bowling Green, Kentucky they this sure weekend. Did. And the reason, a giant Corvette convention. Now, people came to buy, they also came to trade, and some came to race their sports cars. Corvettes of all colors lined Beach Bend Park. Most of the people, though, at the convention were just looking. Good place for the convention, too, because, of course, Bowling Green is the site of the Corvette factory. And that's just about all you can afford to do when you look at those <laughs> look. collector cars. That wraps up our 5 o'clock report. We'll be back at 6. We'll see you then. Good night. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We're going to begin at the... Good evening, I'm John Sigenthaler. And I'm Ann Hold. Shocking reports tonight about why some West Memphis teenagers allegedly murdered three little boys. A Sumner County man is free after spending two years in jail on a murder charge. And gunfire on a Nashville highway sends three college students to the hospital. Metro police say it could have happened to anyone. But tonight, three college students are wondering how they became the victims of a drive-by shooting on the interstate. Channel 2's Mimi Bliss joins us from the Criminal Justice Center with more. Mimi? John, all three MTSU students were wounded, and today we talked to one of them about what happened on I-65. It just it happened so fast. Jerry Wardlow has a bullet lodged in his shoulder. The car he was riding in is riddled with bullets from a high-powered weapon. Jerry and his two best friends were lucky to get out alive. Then all of a sudden, I just heard some shot, and I just, I saw the glass in the back window shatter, so I just rolled to the right side to try to get as low as I could. And as soon as I got ready to roll, the bullet hit me in the, my left shoulder. It could have happened to anybody. 
Detective Al Gray does not believe the three college students provoked the attack. It happened about 2 o'clock this morning on I-65 near downtown. The three were driving home from a Trinity Lane nightclub. And there is no clear explanation for what happened next. My guess, they mistake them for somebody else. That's what, that's, that's what I'm getting at this time. I think they mistake them for somebody else and just start firing them. We really don't know what their motive was because we didn't have any confrontation with no one at the club. Metro police say there's a possibility this shooting is gang related. One student said the gunmen wore colored bandanas wrapped around their heads. And that's something that's commonly associated with gang members. The bullet in Jerry's shoulder can't be removed for at least three months. He hopes to have some answers long before that. I hope they find the guys who did this because they could have easily took one out of lives for no reason at all. Metro police say those shots were fired from a Ford Taurus or Mercury Sable and that there were four men in that car. Police also believe it may have been a rental car. So, John, they are now pursuing that angle to try to track down the suspect. Truly really frightening story because it could happen to anybody. Mimi, what about the other two victims? Are they out of the hospital yet? 21-year-old Kevin Taylor has been released from the hospital with an injury to his leg. As for 20-year-old Terry Jones, he is in fair condition at Vanderbilt. He did have surgery this morning, and, but he is expected to be just fine. All right, Mimi, thanks for the update. Well, more disturbing revelations in the murders of three eight-year-old boys in West Memphis. One of three teenagers arrested in this case is talking to police. According to a statement obtained by the Memphis Commercial Appeal, Jesse Lloyd, Miss Kelly Jr., told authorities that the murders were part of a cult ritual. Miss Kelly also said he watched his two co-defendants choke, rape, and sexually mutilate the victims. Miss Kelly added that before the murders, the three teens had been involved in cult activity, including killing, cooking, and eating dogs. Miss Kelly's mother denies her son was ever involved in a satanic cult. John Robert Spurlock of Gallatin is free on bond tonight after serving more than two years in prison on a murder charge. A murder charge an appeals court says the prosecutor did not prove. The court ruled prosecutor Ray Whitley refused to turn over key evidence to Spurlock's lawyers. Channel 2's Stuart Watson reports. I'm just ready to go home and start my life over. Robert Spurlock walked from the Sumner County Jail a free man free from prison for the first time in two years, eight months. We knew it all along. We knew that it was all fabricated. There was none of it true. A jury convicted Spurlock of stabbing a man named Lonnie Malone in the neck, killing him in a drug deal gone bad. A repeat offender named Henry Apple testified in the trial as a key witness. The Court of Appeals found police had cut a deal with Apple, but prosecutors didn't tell the defense. He said, you know you sat there and you seen them do that and you know if you want this money i got you better come on just go ahead on and say he done it there were no promises uh, to mr apple in exchange for his testimony there was no deal made with mr apple the prosecutor and local detectives made audio and videotapes of apple's statement the tennessee court of criminal appeals found the prosecutor should have handed them over to the defense but he didn't that was a mistake uh, but it was an honest mistake, and it certainly wasn't any kind of mistake to try to cover up or convict somebody uh, uh, improperly. I would never do that. Prosecutors have asked the court for a new trial for Robert Spurlock. Only this time, Spurlock's lawyers will have the audio and videotapes, tapes which at least one judge at the Court of Appeals concluded could clear him. Stuart Watson, Channel 2 News at 6. And prosecutors say Spurlock could go to trial as early as September. Tennessee's Supreme Court ruled today to end a six-month waiting period in the case involving seven frozen human embryos, clearing the way for them to be destroyed. The court ruled in November the embryos were to be disposed of if Junior Davis and his ex-wife, Mary Sue Davis Doe, could not agree on their fate. The cooling-off period was imposed by a Blount County judge last month. Well, Vice President Al Gore turned to Spring Hill Auto Workers today for help. Gore toured the Saturn car plant and then asked workers for their ideas for making the federal government more efficient. Saturn workers say the nation's leaders can profit from their experience. The government can learn a lot from the things that we have implemented. And the key is basically teamwork, dedication, communication, and involving everybody in the decision-making process. Gore will unveil his proposals for streamlining federal government this fall. And still ahead tonight, if it's summertime, it's time for baseball. How to avoid making an error when buying a new glove.
And a country star says the sky's the limit for some brave youngsters. Stay with us. You're watching Channel 2 News at 6 with your hometown news team. Ann Holt, John Sigenthaler, meteorologist Davis Nolan, and the sports guy, Steve Phillips. Well, country music fans from across the nation are in town tonight for one of Music City's biggest events. 24,000 people registered for fanfare today. Signing up for a week of music and, of course, the chance to meet the stars face-to-face. -face. Country star Hal Ketchum is busy putting a few finishing touches on his booth. And with the weather the way it is, singer Marty Brown brought along a fan of a different kind. Well, country star Aaron Tippin helped make a high-flying dream come true for some young cancer patients. Tippin took 10 kids from Nashville's Ronald McDonald House on a once-in-a-lifetime flight. Channel 2's Tom Atwood has the story. See, there's the gas cylinders that they fill that thing up with. The maiden voyage. It is a big day for five-year-old Nicholas Lacey. A ride in a blimp with country music star Aaron Tippin as tour guide. And there's a rhyming auditorium right now. Where country music started, buddy. Suspended high above the city in the blimp's tiny passenger compartment might seem a little frightening for a five-year-old, but not for Nicholas. Hey, Nick. Holler at him. What do you think of this? <laughs> you want to do it again? A bumpy ride like this is nothing compared to what Nick's already been through. Okay to cry, and I know it makes you angry, but you said Two years ago, doctors discovered a cancerous tumor in his brain. They and Nick have been fighting it ever since. That was good. Mm. Did you enjoy being with Aaron? He's well enough now to soar with a country music star and run full speed to tell mom all about it. <laughs> Did you like that ride? Oh, goodness. What did you see? What did you get to see? Always when you think uh, things are pretty tough on you, you can take a look around and see that there's there's people got situations a lot tougher than you and suck it up and keep moving. Hamburger. <laughs> the kids who flew with Tippin got their pictures taken as a souvenir. All right. But Nicholas Lacey probably won't need a photograph <laughs> to remember this day. That's cool. Look at our wings. You see our wings? Show my wings. We've been blimp flying, they better not forget it. <laughs> and Nicholas probably won't. Tom Atwood, Channel 2 News at 6. Now all of the children rode the blimp as guests of Nashville's Ronald McDonald's house. Yeah, that's a great organization and a great event. Mm -hmm, yes, indeed. And to find out what's coming up at 10 tonight on Nightside, we go to Bob Mueller in the newsroom. Bob? And since last month, Cheatham County has been short of deputies. Well, tonight, a special meeting could change what people are calling a critical situation. And the kickoff today of Fanfare includes a major awards show tonight. We'll have the winners and a lot more tonight at 10 on Nightside. Okay, and Bob, we'll see you then. And up next in this newscast, how to avoid paying major league prices for new baseball clubs. And watch out for speeders. The computer age has finally caught up with you. It's sweet. Summertime and baseball, for many, it's the perfect combination. That's right, but many young players find themselves paying major league prices for baseball gloves. As Channel 2's Celeste Bishop tells us in tonight's Consumer Corner, kids can pay less and still be an all-star. This one's pretty good. You want to try it? Okay. In the store, it's hard to predict which glove will perform best on the field. So Consumer Reports asked players and coaches to see how some gloves perform after the umpire yells, play ball. They found most new gloves are difficult to break in. It was kind of stiff when you catch it. In the lab, tester Eric Saperstein also tried to break in the gloves. In the lab, we oiled up each glove using a common glove oil. And then we tied up the gloves, putting a baseball in the pocket. After 24 hours, we took the baseball gloves and untied them. He found some new gloves were harder than others to break in. The spalding we tested was almost as stiff as it was when we started. Testers also found some gloves, including this $160 Wilson, were too bulky for many young players. It is an all-leather glove and has a lot of extra padding. It tends to be too big and awkward for a child. 
and that can lead to errors in the field. Oops. So instead of a heavy all leather glove, try one that's hard vinyl or mesh. They're lighter and a lot cheaper. In the $35 range, testers found several gloves that get the job done, including a Franklin and a Mizuno. Both had adequate padding and were easy hey. to break in. In the Consumer Corner, Celeste Bishop, Channel 2 News at 6. Now, if you can wait until August to buy a new glove, you might find some bargains. Consumer Reports saved $22 on one glove by waiting for the end of the summer sales. Computers make many things easier, but you might find some Texas motorists who disagree. Texas Highway Troopers are now carrying portable radio control computers that write traffic tickets. The electronic notebook automatically checks the person's driving license and, in some cases, schedules a court date. Officers like it because it cuts down on paperwork. Uh, no comment from the motorists who get pulled over. But I bet they don't like it. <laughs> I don't think they would. <laughs> well, summer isn't officially over here yet, but you'd never know it if you stepped outside. Davis will have a hot and humid forecast when we come back. The Channel 2 News 24-hour weather information line with the official time and the latest weather forecast. Call 259-WKRN. Open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, every time we've had uh, some cool weather, we've had a running debate about what That's to right. call it. <laughs> exactly. Although it's warm out there now, we did have a chilly weekend. Uh, Sunday, we were down to 52 degrees, one degree shy of a record low. Now, a lady named Lucille McDonald was nice enough to write me a letter, and uh, she was mentioning the late Red O'Donnell, the columnist for the newspapers. And he had mentioned in one of his columns, after we'd had Blackberry winter and after we'd had Cotton Gresham's winners, we had green frog days. And everybody was elated to hear what the new cool snap would be called. Uh, amazing there, and we appreciate Miss Lucille McDonald for giving me that information from the late Red O'Donnell. Well, it's not cool anymore, though we had a cool weekend. Look at the high temperature today, all the way up to 91 degrees, and it was 91 all the way up to last hour. 65 the low this morning, no rainfall, sunrise 529, sunset 802, and mostly sunny skies right now, 89 degrees, humidity 50%. A southwest wind at 13 miles per hour, the pressure is steady at 29.96 inches of mercury. The allergy update, the pollen count 37, 98% of that grass, 2% pine, the fungus mole spore count 1,893. Here's our southeastern satellite view. Big thunderstorms push across the Chicago area and then continue across the Great Lakes, the lower Great Lakes here, dumping four to five inches in some of the southwest suburbs of Chicago, some local street flooding around there. Other big thunderstorms now getting underway in Iowa, pushing into the Kansas City area, back into central Oklahoma. Tornado watch is in effect for much of that area for this evening. Very slow moving system. It's not really going to get here with its thunder shower activity until probably Thursday and by then it'll weaken a little bit. We may see some isolated to scattered afternoon showers, but the brunt of that system will be here by Thursday. 90 last hour in New Orleans, 79 in the nation's capital, 76 up in Boston. Up in the northern tier of the country, it was a cool 57 in Bismarck with showers around, 63 in Boise and 67 out on the coast at Los Angeles. Now tomorrow's weather map, that front doesn't push much, much closer to us. It's only in Missouri by tomorrow afternoon late, so partly sunny continued hot and humid for us with highs in the low 90s. There will be the slight chance of seeing a few scattered afternoon thunder showers tomorrow, and maybe a slight few more on Wednesday, and then the best chance for thunder showers as I see it right now will be Thursday when that front actually slides on through. And then, maybe Thursday and Friday, we can get rid of some of the hot 90s. Here's our forecast for tonight, though. Fair skies, it's going to be a muggy night. The humidity is very high, a low of about 70. It's still in the upper 80s out there right now, so it is going to be a little on the muggy side, especially compared to what we've been used to. And then tomorrow, it'll be warm and breezy again. That breeze will be a little bit of a relief to the high near 90. And a low tomorrow night near 70, the slight chance of an isolated afternoon thunderstorm. On Wednesday, pretty much the same there. That next front gets closer to us by Thursday, so a better chance for thunderstorms then with highs in the mid-80s, and then we'll drop to mid-80s for highs for Friday and Saturday with some lower humidity and lows in the 60s. So when's the next winter? I don't care oh what goodness. you call it. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, I would like to see it, too. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll have one soon. <laughs> Thank you, Davis. Mm -hmm. Well, still ahead, the Indiana Pacers have a new coach who's an old, familiar face. And at the College World Series, players are imitating the pros. The Phillips and Sport, up next. Smooth Sailing, sponsored by the Tennessee Wild Mazda of Hickory Hollow. Sports, brought to you by Kroger. Boxer George Foreman says he's been working up 
to tonight and come what may his career is over after this well that's what he says and how many how much uh, stock do you put into a boxer retiring how many of them have retired he can afford at to least after tonight well that's right that's I mean, right if you make 10 million dollars you know you can uh, afford to kind of sit back there will be a no, new WBO heavyweight champion tonight. George Foreman and Tommy Morrison battle in Las Vegas for the vacant and lightly regarded title. Both fighters have impressive records. Morrison is 36-1 with 32 knockouts in his career. And Foreman is 26-1 since his return after a 10-year layoff. Both are known as knockout artists, and Foreman believes that will hold true tonight. Uh, wherever there's George Foreman, there's going to be someone on the canvas sooner or later. Uh, almost on the canvas. It's going to be a tough fight. Uh, I've been training. I've e been eating a little different. I haven't been any more cheeseburger. They're hot dogs now. That's why you've heard very little. Very little. Very little hot dogs. <laughs> well, it wasn't a heavyweight title fight, but it wasn't your average baseball shoving match either last night in Baltimore. When Mike Mussina's pitch hit Bill Hasselman, both benches emptied onto the field. It took more than 20 minutes and several police officers to break it up. No doubt a lengthy list of fines and suspensions will be forthcoming. Former Nashville Sound Norm Charlton, now of Seattle, says he's never seen anything like it. This is Those things usually, uh, I mean, you know, usually you end up with a pile and it breaks up and, and it's over with. So, yeah, that was a pretty ugly one. Well, the College World Series continued today in Omaha as Arizona State took on Oklahoma State. Rain fell as the game got underway between the Sun Devils and the Cowboys. The rain made the turf a little slippery. In the first, Sean Hugo hits it to left field. Sean Tyler slips and falls. And the ball falls in for a hit as Ernesto Rivera makes it 1-0 Oklahoma State. Arizona State tied the game, then Cody McKay played long ball, smacking it to left center field where it clears the wall to make it 2-1 Arizona State. In the sixth, Paul LaDuco singles to right field to chase home a run and make it 4-0. But a little shove at the plate by catcher Joe Wallace starts a small fight. Both benches would empty. Joe Wallace was ejected. And Oklahoma State came back to beat Arizona State 5-4. Well, it's official the Indiana Pacers did the expected today and named Larry Brown their new head coach. Brown had stepped down as coach of the Los Angeles Clippers when they were eliminated from the playoffs by Houston. Brown has been a bit of a gypsy as a coach, having made previous NBA stops at Denver, New Jersey, San Antonio, and the Clippers. He also coached collegiately at UCLA and at Kansas. Something of a gypsy indeed. The NHL uh, Stanley Cup Finals tonight in Los Angeles. Uh, Montreal leading that series two games to one. And uh, they play the Kings tonight. Of course, uh, if they win uh, tonight, they'll be up 3-1 and go back to Montreal where they could finish the series. So all, all George has to do is walk out and he gets $10 million. He walks out and they ring the opening bell. He's got $10 million. Not bad. Not bad. Of course, money. then you, you know, you got to stand in the way of a few shots to the chin to get that. All right. Well, <laughs> part of the deal. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. And finally, the secret is out about one legendary superhero. People in Metropolis, Illinois, recently unveiled a new statue in honor of Superman. The famous comic book character stands 15 feet tall and weighs just 4,400 pounds. Now, you might think the Man of Steel would be made of that metal. Not in Metropolis. He's done in bronze. Some pretty good likeness on that. Yeah, I bet kryptonite won't even hurt that guy now. <laughs> That's our news. Thanks for watching. Join us again at 10. We'll see you then. award winner for overall news excellence in the Mid-South. Join us again tonight for Channel 2 News at 10 with Bob Mueller and John Sigenthaler. It took a long